There's a slide that says um, something about feelings and then holding fast to the truth. Can you pull up that slide real quick? It's the bridge, something about uh, I will not be formed by feelings. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? So you guys check this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you guys know, like today is, uh, this is going to be a fun morning together. And by fun, I mean um, we're raising the bar. We're raising the bar. So uh, need your minds, hearts engaged. Hopefully everyone ha- has had at least four shots of espresso. All right, that's key. That's key. So, so notice this verse here. And, and this is so key. Like, here's what I'm thankful for. You know, we're singing songs. And I don't know if we stop to really think about the lyrics. But I won't be formed by feelings but I will hold fast to what is true. So let's just call that second line facts. I'm going to say it like an eighth grade boy with some attitude. Facts. <laughs> Write that down in your notes. Facts. All caps. No sus. I don't know. Whatever. So it's going to be super busting today. That's all I know, right? All right. Here's the thing. Too many of us, we are feeling zapped in life. We are feeling weary in life. Why? Because I think we put too much emphasis on our feelings and we don't strive to understand facts, truth. Like when we sing this, like, do we really understand like what we're, what we're talking about? Because this really fits in with the message this morning. Like this morning, I want to talk about like, what, what is it that, that forms that inner strength in us? What is it that gives us the spiritual vitality to, to keep pressing on? Because I'm going to show you some some snapshots of some men and women this morning and really what fueled them, what got them going uh, every single day. I'm going to tell you, this is a group of people in the scriptures that are not formed by their feelings, but they are going to hold fast to the truth, the, f- the facts. And um, I-, I think we come in and we're, we're all pretty tired. Let, let's just, who's tired today? Let, just raise your hand. Who's really tired? Like, let me just tell you, I, I wish I could sleep in on a Sunday like most people do. Um, I don't get to sleep in on a Sunday. I don't get to sleep on on many days. I mean, all of us get tired, right? All of us feel weary, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with feeling tired or weary. But I think there's a deeper weariness and a deeper tiredness that sets in because I think we tend to chase all the wrong things. I'm going to tell you right now, four things the world encourages us to chase chase that that are not life-giving. Can I just name them real quick? Power, prestige, pleasure, popularity. I think the world just says, hey, keep pursuing these things and you're going to be, you're going to be set. And I'm going to say, the more we pursue those things, we just get tired. And, and it's amazing how the Bible tells us that greatness is never me- measured by those things. Greatness, according to God, is never measured by pleasure, popularity, power, or prestige. Greatness, according to Jesus, is measured by, get this, ready? Servanthood. Write down that word, servanthood. And and, and we're lost today in this this mire of just selfishness, selfish pursuits. And we have a hard time of thinking of others as more important than ourselves. And yet here's this, this, this Jesus who arrives on the scene who says, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Here's what I'm going to tell you, and I know this is going to be hard to believe at the outset, but hopefully by the end you, you, you buy it. Your spiritual vitality, your energy will be given to you by God when you start thinking about others as more important than yourself. I really believe there's a strength that God gives us, a vitality when we walk with Christ because then we become like him and he came to serve. And perhaps serving one another is is the, the secret to really tapping into what God would want for us and for others. We turn to Acts chapter 18, we're actually going to Exit 18, enter 19, which is fun. Are we allowed to cross chapters? I, I, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And we're going to see this picture of men and women who have given themselves fully, wholeheartedly to the, to the work of God in serving people. And they're going to serve three different types of people, and we're going to talk about this this morning. And this is hard stuff. I'm going to tell you this is hard stuff. And even as I'm preparing this message this week, I'm going, 
God, how do you want me to communicate this? There are some weeks it's easy. Like, there are weeks I get to sleep in. Not this week. Because I'm thinking about, like, how do I communicate this? Because it's an interesting scene here. We have these three snapshots, a group of people who are in Christ, and they need to be deepened in their faith. There's a guy who is almost there, but not completely there, so he's partially with Jesus. And then there's a group that just don't know Jesus at all. And, and I think that represents the, the totality of our experiences and people in our lives. You're going to meet people who are far from Jesus. You're going to meet people that are almost right there. And then you're going to meet people who are in Jesus. My question to you is this. How do we serve those people? How do we serve all those type of people? That's, that's the secret in what we call discipleship. And, and that's really a lost word today, discipleship. And, and David in his announcements talked about next month, we're talking about this growth track thing. And, and this is really it. It's how do we make more and better disciples? How do we help one another serve one another so that we're equipping the saints and mobilizing the saints for the work of ministry? Because here's what we're going to try to try to get you to believe, and I think through the Holy Spirit and through His truth that we're going to do this. You're all priests in the household of God. You're all ministers in the household of God. You're all pastors in the household of God. How do we pastor one another? How do we serve one another? How do we make this just really the, the life be in the pulse of everything we do and everything we're about? So Acts 18, 19 gives us this picture of, of this spiritual vitality, serving others, um, this confident, compassionate love in action, which is really serving. That's what I, how I would define serving. So if you want to write that down, that's good. Serving is confident and compassionate love in action. You don't serve because you have to. You serve because you want to. And as you've been served, which is by a God of kindness and mercy and grace and compassion, you, you do the same for one another. So versus me continuing to yammer on, let's look at the scripture. 18, Acts 18, starting verse 23. And what we'll do is we'll read through the section, and then I'll go back and we'll just kind of kind of knock it out verse by verse. And I, and I hopefully will, you'll see what what's happening here. And as I like to say, and, and a couple people mentioned this, like one of my favorite phrases you say, Scott, and I know I say a lot, and some of them I don't want to re be remembered for, uh, but some I do. Uh, maybe this message, I think, is one of those where I'm going to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. How's that sound? So I might yell a little bit, uh, just, just a heads up, because this is so, there's an urgency here. All right, Acts 18, verse 23, having spent some time there, so I'm at Paul, he departed, passed successfully through Galatia region, Phrygia, uh, Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Circle the word strengthening. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus and he was mighty in scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. That's Corinth. And when he arrived, he helped greatly those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Meanwhile, it came about that while Apollos was going to Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, Hmm. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in Jesus who was coming after him. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And then Paul laid his hands upon them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And they were in all about 12 dudes. I mean, men, that's how I read dudes. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts. Can I just tell you, this is a really complicated section of Scripture. 
There's some interesting things going on here. I, I think I've arrived at, at, I think, what, what God would want us to, to understand, and, and it's really a message about discipleship. How do we grow in Christ? How do we help others grow in Christ? Perhaps there's no greater objective for our faith than what Jesus left us with in Matthew 28 when he told the disciples, go into all the world and make disciples. Right? Go make disciples, baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And know this, I am with you when you do that work. Isn't that awesome? There's a great, there's, a, there's, this, there's this promise, but it's predicated on a command. Go make disciples and baptize. And when you do that, know that I am with you. Hear the, hear the vitality language there. Hear the strength language. When you do what God wants you to do, he strengthens you. When you don't do what God wants you to do, it can be tiring. Can I get an amen from somebody? All right. So let's go back and let's look at the three movements, the three scenes here that I think are so important. The first one is this. We see a deeper establishing of immature faith. Or I should change the preposition to with. A deeper establishing with immature faith. What I'm trying to communicate is this. Paul, in verse 23 of chapter 18 goes back to those places that he had planted churches in in his first and second missionary journey. I love this about the heart of Paul because Paul did not want just to bag and tag people. He wanted to help deepen their faith in Christ. So he, on his first journey, went to certain places and planted churches and people came to know the Lord and he raised up leaders and he wanted to follow up and see how they were doing. Second missionary, he does it again. Third missionary, I mean, this guy does not stop. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He's in his 50s. He's as old as me. And he keeps doing this in the midst of opposition, in the midst of persecution. Why? Because his heart beats, I want to make sure people are growing in Christ. As a matter of fact, I think the heartbeat of Paul should be the heartbeat of all. Ooh, you like that? Write that down. That's good. The heartbeat of Paul should be the heartbeat of all, and that is, how do I strengthen other believers in the faith? Because this, this is a responsibility that falls on all of us, and I'm going to show you this. Too many people are spectators when it comes to Christianity. Too many people are just on the sidelines, they're in the stands, right? They're not on the field playing, and God wants us in the game. And all of us, at bare minimum, have a responsibility to pour into others' lives as we would have them pour into ours. Matter of fact, write down the, 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 the word Dead Sea. Anyone ever been to the Dead Sea? Anyone ever been to the Holy Land, right? You know why the Dead Sea's dead? Because there's water going in, but there's no water going out. How many Christians fall into that, that analogy? Where they are dead spiritually. Why? Not that they're not getting stuff put into them. Many of us are seeking to be poured into. The problem is, who are you pouring your life out into? That's discipleship. It's not only being discipled, but being a disciple. And I would tell you this, that every single person in Christ is called to be discipled and to disciple. That's why the urgency with what we're looking at next month with the growth tracks is because I believe we can do better. I believe we as a church community perhaps can, can start even diving deeper into the will of God for what we call church and doing so much more than what we have been doing. Not that what we have been doing hasn't been, is, is, is bad, but I think we can go further faster together. And so Paul says there are people who are immature in their faith. Can I just tell you, that's every single one of us in this room. No one has reached presidential level when it comes to maturity in Christ. Amen? We're all works in progress. We all have room to grow. I have men who pour into my life. I have men that I pour my life into. And I have people in general, not just men, but women too, that we walk in community together, and here is my goal, that I learn, you learn, and we all continue to grow into conformity into the image of Christ Jesus. Amen? So Paul does this. And he wants you to know that this is actually really, really hard work. Can I, can I tell you something? And I don't mean to be crude when I say this. Um, saving people is, is easy. Sanctifying people is hard work. 
Now, some of you are like, saving people is easy? How can you say that? Here's why. It's God who saves. <laughs> can I get an amen from somebody? Like, oh, you know what? You're right. Thank you, Lord. Like, he does the hard work. He saves us. And at the end of the day, he alone is the one that changes the heart and, and changes the, the, the spiritual position of, and passions of a person. Praise God for his faithful work in people's lives. Here's the hard work. Then he says to the church, now come along those people that I have saved <laughs> and now help them grow in Jesus. And we're all like, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> how many excuses do we come up with? Because it's hard walking with people. That's, that's why on, a, on an Easter Sunday, it's easy to, to count heads at church, right? I have a group of people who email me after Easter and they say, how many people did you have at your Easter service? And I go, that's the wrong question. Because I'm not celebrating attendance and, and butts and seats. That's easy. Here's what I want you to ask me. Six months from now, how are those people that were there Easter walking with Jesus more vibrantly than they were then? See, we're not asking that question. Why? Because that requires blood, sweat, and tears. I'm really selling this, aren't I? <laughs> but hard work is holy work. You think Jesus had a good time three and a half years with his disciples? And this is Jesus. And they're like, uh, we don't know what you're doing. We don't know who you are. He's like, how long have I been with you? You still don't know who I am? Like, I feel good after Jesus says that. Because that's Jesus. And he's three and a half years with these guys, and they don't get it. Here's what I know, is that we can do better. We're all growing, we're all maturing, we're all becoming more and more like Jesus. We can't let our foot up off the accelerator pedal. We got to keep going. And, and Paul, he, go, he retraces his steps. First journey, second journey, now he's on his third journey. And between verse 22 and 23, that's when he starts his third journey. And this guy is just kicking butt and taking names in, in a good way strengthening the church in Christ. And the only instrument that is used to sanctify the church is the word of God. Write down the, the Bible. John 17, 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. He says, Father, and he prays for us. This is what's amazing in John 17. Jesus prays for us, and he says, sanctify them in truth, your word is truth. That word sanctify is the, the word that means we are growing, we are maturing, we are becoming more like Jesus. Apart from the truth, apart from the word, there is no growth. Where the knowledge of God ceases, your maturity in Christ ceases. And so this is why we press into the word. This is why we, we approach texts like this and go, what's happening here? So Paul, as this apostle of Jesus, knew well that there is no chance for maturity apart from the word of God. You cannot grow as a Christian without a continual increasing understanding of the word. And this is why we are so word-oriented. Amen? Amen. This is why I give you a smattering of verses, because I want you, and there's going to be a lot this morning, so let's all work out our hands. If we're writing with an imp, a writing implement or work out whatever, you're going to be hurting by the end of the day, because there is going to be the word that I pray is used to sanctify you as it sanctifies me, and we get sanctified together. Point two. So Paul is helping people in their immaturity. Then all of a sudden in verse 24, the scene shifts. And we go to Ephesus. Now, you know, Ephesus, we were there last week when Paul dropped off of Priscilla and Aquila there. He leaves Corinth. Then he goes across the bay, gets a haircut at the first great clips that ever existed in the world. So he's there. And meanwhile, while he's getting his haircut, he plants a church, right? He's like, I got 30 minutes, plants a church. Lands in Ephesus. He's there for a moment, drops Priscilla and Aquila. I don't even think they knew where, what the plan was. All of a sudden, he's like, see you guys soon. They're like, wait, what, where are you going? But Priscilla and Aquila, they're rock stars. They stay in Ephesus. Paul takes the hair that's been cut off his head to Jerusalem and drops it off there, right? Because he had taken a Nazarite vow. He has had a good season with God, and this was just his way of just saying, 
man, I extra just want to be devoted to you right now and committed to you and consecrated to you. So he goes to Jerusalem, gets his hair burned. Glad you're not a neighbor in that neighborhood. <laughs> burnt hair again. Who's, who's doing the Nazarite vow? Like giving him dirty looks and all that, right? Whatever. He stays in Jerusalem. He doesn't hang out in Jerusalem a lot. Paul is not a big fan of Jerusalem. You want to know why? Because Jerusalem knew him in his B.C. days. He's having Christians killed in Jerusalem. He doesn't have a good reputation. Even though he's in Christ, there's still people that are praying with one eye open when Paul's around. So he leaves Jerusalem. He goes to Antioch. He likes Antioch. Antioch is this multi-ethnic community that believes, it has a missionary heart. And they're sending people out, and they send Paul and Barnabas out on his first journey. They send Paul and Silas out on the second journey. So he goes back to Antioch. It's been two years since he's been with them. He's like, can I just tell you guys what's been going on? Right? But his, his desire was in Ephesus to come back. Like, I, if God wills, I want to come see you again. Guess what happens? God honors that prayer. So he, he's heading back to Ephesus. But meanwhile, in Ephesus, look at verse 24. There's a certain guy who steps up. His name's Apollos. And he was an Alexandrian, Alexandrian by birth. Let's stop right there. This is an interesting dude. I really like Apollos. He's mentioned several times in Corinthians. He's mentioned in other places in Scripture. He is brilliant. He is educated. He is eloquent. He is a Jew by birth, but he's got a pagan name, Apollos, which comes from Apollonius, which means son of Apollo. He, he knows about Jesus, but yet he doesn't know about Jesus. A little bit odd. But he comes from this place called Alexandria. It's in Egypt. One of the greatest cities of the ancient world. Second largest city in the Roman Empire. Why is this important? Because this is a city of about 400,000 people. Had the largest library in the world. Alexandria, 700,000 volumes. Huge. That was ultimately burned to the ground by Julius Caesar in 48 AD. Gone. But meanwhile, this city had been founded by a guy named Alexander the Great, hence the name Alexandria. And all these great minds came out of that Alexandria. Clement, Euclid. Do you guys know who Euclid is? You ever use geometry? Father of geometry. Comes from Alexandria. Uh, Philo, who is this Jewish historian, who did this interesting thing. He takes the Old Testament, and then he takes Greek theology, and he says, how can we merge the two? Weird. And I think Apollos probably sat under Philo's teaching. That's why he kind of gets Jesus and he doesn't. But one of the most significant things about Alexandria is that in Alexandria was produced what we call the Septuagint. This is such geek territory. I'm sorry, but this is important. The Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Matter of fact, in your Bibles, if you have a study Bible, oftentimes commentators will refer to the Septuagint and they'll use three Roman numerals, LXX, which is the Roman numeral for 70. Good job. 70 men oversaw the translation of the Hebrew into the Greek, and now we have all these volumes of the Septuagint that give us good evidence that the Hebrew scriptures were from God and they were accurate in all that they had detailed. There's a whole history and science behind why we have these Bibles today in English and why we can trust certain translations. I won't go into it now, but the Septuagint is an important part of that. And the reason I mention all this is because within Christian circles, there's this question of who wrote the book of Hebrews? You ever, those of you who, I know when someone's walked with Jesus for a while when they ask me, Pastor, who do you think wrote the book of Hebrews? You throw that question into a mix of pastors together for lunch, you're going to get a dog fight, right? Because Hebrews doesn't ever claim authorship by anybody. I'm going to tell you this morning that I lean towards Apollos being the author of Hebrews. Here's why. The language of Hebrews is a classical educational level of intellectualism that I think goes way beyond John and way beyond Paul. John wrote the easiest of Greek. It's called Koine Greek. It was the commoner's Greek. It was like the street language Greek. Hebrews, the language is different than the other writings, so I think it sets it apart. Number two, there are so many Old Testament references. It would make sense if someone's translating into Greek the original Hebrew that someone was really knowledgeable of Old Testament. It's found throughout Hebrews. I think Apollos is the guy. I'm not going to die on that hill. And some of you are like, I'm mad at you, pastor. For you know, whatever. 
That's what I think. Now back to Apollos. I think after the fire in Alexandria, he goes to Ephesus. And here's what we see in this man's ministry. Look at verse 24. There's this guy. He's uh, named Apollos. He's an Alexandrian by birth. He is an eloquent man, and he came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in scriptures. Can I just stop you right there and go, boy, I pray for a church of men and women who are mighty in scriptures. And I'm going to tell you right now, being mighty in scripture is more important than wisdom, education, intellectualism, eloquence, persuasiveness. I want you and you want me to be mighty people of, wisdom, of, of, of scripture. Amen? So he just brought the word to town. And look at the response, verse 25. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He's being fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately. Circle that word accurately. He, with what he was saying, he was saying everything. It was truthful. It was in line with scripture, right? The things concerning Jesus, but here's the Uh uh-oh moment, notice, but he was only acquainted with the baptism of John. His understanding of Jesus was limited. And it wasn't limited in a good way. He, He only understood Jesus as much as you get with the John the Baptist and and what John the Baptist says. Can I ask you a question? Was there more about Jesus after John the Baptist? Just a little bit. So, would you say a person who is who's knowledgeable in Scripture and, and is fervent and is eloquent and, is, and has a lot of zeal, but only understands things up to John the Baptist, do you think that they are incomplete in their faith? Yes. Look what happens next. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, which was great. So he's a Jew. He's allowed in the synagogue. And, of course, he's mighty in Scripture. So he comes to the synagogue, takes a play right out of Paul's book, and he starts proclaiming this truth in the synagogue. And then guess who happens to be there that synagogue morning? Priscilla and Aquila. Can I just tell you? Rock star couple. Rock star couple. You want to know what makes the, their relationship so wonderful is that they are both united in Christ. What makes them so wonderful is that they are ministering together in Christ. Amen? Can I just encourage you, married couples, soon-to-be married people, look for somebody that loves Jesus desperately, and look for somebody that you can partner with and serve alongside of. And I'm going to tell you, a healthy marriage is not ever based on sex or communication or money or houses or whatever. A healthy marriage before God is one that is rooted in Christ and is determined to serve Jesus together. And here's what I love about this couple. Her name comes first. And you want to know why? I think she was a little bit smarter than her husband. And can I tell you, he was probably okay with that. Can I just encourage you guys? Your wives may have a little bit more going on with Jesus than you do, and that's okay. Don't let that insecurity, you know, play that nasty game with you, right? Just, you know what? Just buckle in and be the man that God wants you to be. But sometimes our wives get things more than we get things. Can I get an amen from somebody? I know this to be true in my own world. My wife continues to teach me lessons and show me things. I go, what? It's only taking me 30 plus years to figure that out. But she is obviously more mature, more steeped in the things of God. I think God's really using her. And she has her husband's support. And I think they've learned the difference between competing and completing. Matter of fact, write that down. Too many marriages just compete, compete, compete. You are not married to your enemy, amen? You are not married to your adversary. You're not married to your foe. You're not married to the person that's out to get you. Until you learn the art of completion, your marriage will not be complete. The person that you are married to has been given to you by God to make you a better person, not to make you mad, not to make you angry, not to make you upset. They're going to teach you so much about yourself, you better be open to it. Because you will either respect that relationship or you'll resent it, and there's no in-between. Your marriage is, you're not married to your your spouse because of competition. You're married because of completion. And that takes a lifetime to figure out. How many of us need to hear that right now? Just amen, praise God. Okay, good. Two of you, I'll pray for you. (laughs) So Priscilla, Aquila, they're in synagogue, and they're going, dude, this Apollos, he's on fire. This guy's good. They're like looking at each other like, man, this guy's gold. 
And then all of a sudden he keeps speaking, and all of a sudden their smiles like turn into something else. And you know married couples get this like nonverbal way of communicating with each other where you kind of look at each other and you're like, something's not right. Something is incomplete about Apollos' message. Look what happens. The Priscilla and Aquila are there. They heard him. They take him aside and explain to him the way of God more accurately. Something is missing. And what is it that's missing? He doesn't understand the full orb of the gospel of grace. What do I mean by that? If you stop at the baptism of John, you'll miss out on the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, and the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. There's a lot more to the story. So Priscilla and Quill are like, what do we do? How do we handle this? How do we approach this? You ever thought about, you know, correcting somebody, but you're like, how do I do that? So many of us feel like, I'm in no position to correct somebody. I'm growing myself. I have no business speaking into somebody's life, but this was such an important, this guy is rising in popularity and fame because he's so brilliant. He's so eloquent. He's so well-educated, but they're like, he doesn't know the rest of the story. And so God moves them to invite him over for dinner. I think that's what happens here. I think after the synagogue service, they're like, Apollo, say, hey, I'm Aquila, this is why my wife Priscilla, hey, we've got this pot roast at home cooking right now, and it's more than the two of us can eat. Can, will you come over and join us? And let me just say, she made this peach cobbler. It is fantastic. Come on over. Let's sit, let's talk, let's get to know one another. And in the context of eating together, they sit there and go, hey, great message today, really like what you said, but can we just let you know something? There's more to what you shared than what you know. And Apollos goes, what? And they teach him the way more accurately. There's a couple things going on here. One is, let me just tell you about their approach with Apollos, because it is always a very sensitive thing to correct somebody. right? To come alongside and be like, boy, you know what? You're there, but you're not all the way there. Here's how you make correction God-honoring. So write down correction in your notes. I'm going to give you an equation. I hate math. You all know this. I tore out the book of numbers out of my Bible years ago. <laughs> hate it so much. Just kidding, I didn't. Correction equals conviction plus compassion. This is how you correct somebody to the glory of God. Too many people correct out of conviction with no compassion. And I think we all know what it means to be lambasted in the name of Jesus. You ever feel bludgeoned or bullied after someone approaching you? You're just like, well, that hurt. <laughs> but also, if there's no conviction, there's only compassion, is it really correction? I think you're looking to be, have someone like you versus have someone respect you. Both have to be present. Cor conviction plus compassion equals God-honoring correction. If you want to write it another way, it's an open Bible and a loving tone together. Boy, the moment someone wants to sit down and say, hey, pastor, I have some hard words I need to share with you. Here's what I'm looking for, a loving tone and an open Bible. Because if we're just talking about like choices and preferences that are not really rooted in Scripture, we can talk about it, but it's ultimately not things we're going to die for. I would hope we come to one another with an open Bible and a loving tone, and God is glorified in whatever exchange needs to happen. And, and not only is there humility in their approach, there's humility in his acceptance of what they have to say. Notice what happens in verse 27. He, 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 he goes and continues to serve the Lord. Like, he doesn't sit there and go, how dare you guys correct me? I'm smarter than you. I'm prettier than you. I'm <laughs> whatever. He, accepted, he accepts it. And then the church in Ephesus says, go to Corinth and go crazy for Jesus. And notice what it says. He goes he helps greatly those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He's got the whole story now. Isn't that awesome? 
So now here's the serious part of, of why he needed to be corrected and with what he was corrected with. Jesus, so John comes on the scene and is a forerunner. He is a pointer. And this is what we can talk about with John's baptism. It is a baptism of foreshadowing. So John the Baptist, who's cousins with Jesus, and you remember when Elizabeth was pregnant with him, he jumped with joy in the womb because the Holy Spirit moved him. He was a unique dude. He goes and lives this ascetic life in the desert. He wears camel's hair, and he eats locusts and honey. Sounds amazing. And then he calls the people to repent, and he's baptizing people out there in the river. He even baptizes his cousin. And he even says, like, who am I? I'm not even worthy to untie your to, 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 to even touch your shoes. But Jesus submits himself to John's baptism, but even John would declare in Luke 3, 16, these words, this is important. So if you've been sleeping, wake up, pay attention now. Jesus answered them all saying, I baptize you. John answered them and said, I baptize you with water. So stop right there. His baptism is a foreshadowing baptism. I will tell you symbolic. Because here's what we, we can all agree on. Just because you are physically baptized doesn't mean you're saved. Amen? Just because you take communion when we do communion doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you hang out at church doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you sing songs at the loudest voice you can sing doesn't mean you're saved, right? Those are all external things. John's saying, I'm baptizing you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming. So obviously he's pointing future, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Meaning there is going to be such an internal change with what he does in his baptism. Get ready. Apollos didn't understand the rest of the ministry of Jesus. He may have heard about Jesus. He may have gone and, and been baptized by John himself. We don't know too much about Apollos. Maybe he had some friends that were like, dude, we just got back from, from, the, from Palestine. And dude, there's this guy, he is dressed weird and he's eating crazy stuff, but he's baptizing people. And everyone got excited about John's baptism, but no one ever heard the rest of the story. That Jesus would die, be buried, rise on the third day, appear to hundreds of people and ascend into heaven and upon his ascension would give the Holy Spirit as promise to be that comforter, to be that counselor. In a word, here's what I'm pressing into you guys. Union. Write down the word union. It is one thing to be baptized in water. It's another thing to be baptized in in the life that Christ has purchased for you. Romans 6, look at it later. We don't have it on the screen. Paul says, if you have believed, you have been crucified with Christ, you've been buried with him, and you've risen to new life in him. That's called union. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. But in him, you are everything. And you have everything. Every spiritual blessing has been given to you. And so what Apollos does not understand is one of the great misunderstandings even in our day is that men and women who claim to know Jesus don't understand their union in him. As a matter of fact, this is Paul's favorite phrase when you read Paul's writings, whatever it be, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, he always uses the phrase with the believer, in Christ. As a matter of fact, write that word, in Christ, that phrase. You are in Christ. And when you are in Christ and he is in you, look out, spiritual vitality is off the charts. Spiritual growth is happening. Spiritual investment in other people is going on. And, and you are where God wants you to be. In Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The old man is gone. The new man has come. I'm new creation in him. So union is huge. And I, don't, I believe this to be true. Most people who sit in our churches 
don't understand this vital union that is now yours because of what Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection. And if you don't understand that, you are hamstringing your spiritual walk. And this is why we don't look too redeemed. This is why we don't sound too redeemed. This is why when we talk about Jesus, we're like this. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no excitement. There's not in that internal knowing who I am in him. And let me just say, that's a lifelong area of growth for all of us, understanding who you are in Christ. Don't think you're going to get it right out of the bat. Don't think you're going to get it 30 years in. It takes a lifetime to be conformed to the image of Jesus, but God is committed to that lifelong journey. Can I get an amen from somebody? So Aquila and Priscilla have to pull this guy aside and be like, you're saying some good things, but they're, they're, they're incomplete. And my responsibility as a pastor, our responsibility as a church, is to create a culture where we understand who we are in Jesus. And what it means to is sometimes addressing those things that are, that are hard to address, that are hard to bring up, that are hard to talk about. But to understand not the, the baptism of John, but to understand the Jesus baptism, which is a baptism of fulfillment, everything Jesus came to do, he did. That's why he echoed those famous three words on the cross. It is, woohoo! can I get it? Yeah, that's good, right? It is finished. What's finished? Christ came to do everything he, wanted, he needed to do for the sake of his people. He didn't do it for himself. He didn't have to. He's God. But yet he comes to serve, not to be served. Why? Because he's given his life as a ransom for many. And now the goal, once you're saved, is to grow in sanctification. Lord, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. And so here's Apollos. Here's Aquila. Here's, here's what I love. Plurality of this team. Everyone's unique. Everyone's different. Hence the body of Christ. We're all made up of different personalities. We all have different gifts. This is another thing we're going to talk about in the growth tracks. How God has uniquely gifted you. If you're in Christ, you've been given at least one spiritual gift to use for his kingdom purposes. And when we do this together and we become this well-oiled machine in Jesus... You can storm hell with a squirt gun and no one's stopping us. Can I get an amen? That's good, right? Some of you are like, well, that's good. Maybe we'll get squirt guns that Sunday and we'll squirt everybody. When you are dialed into who you are in Christ, how you've been equipped by him for the work of service for his glory and his kingdom, and you do it in a team called church, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. 87% of people who sit in church today don't know what their spiritual gift is. And you wonder why we're not effective as the body of Christ. You wonder why we're not making a difference for God and his kingdom. I mean, he's still doing stuff, but we can do better. And so here's, here's Aquila, Priscilla saying, hey, Apollos, we just met, but we love you and we love what you're doing. There's more. And he gets the full story, and look what happens. He just goes gangbusters for Jesus. Why? Because someone was willing to pour into his life, and now he's pouring into others. And I'm going to tell you something which is really interesting here is that Paul and Apollos become good friends. See, Paul had already been to Corinth, planted churches, but now Apollos goes to Corinth to nurture and edify those churches there. But Corinth started liking Apollos better than Paul. You ever do this? You ever play favorites with pastors and, and theologians? Can I just tell you, stop? I don't care if you like someone better than me. I don't care if you like me better than someone else. Can I just tell you right now, this is a way God, like, this is a way the devil infiltrates the church, and, and we become, we, we tend to celebritize pastors, and we shouldn't. Can I get an amen on that? Um, I don't care if you glorify, I don't want you to glorify me, I want you to glorify God. I'm not pitted against Pastor Tony or Pastor Lynn or Pastor whatever. Like, we're all dudes working on the same team, trying to accomplish the same mission, love people to Jesus, right? And, and there are plenty of people who can tell you, uh, present the gospel better than I can, but no one can ever present you a better gospel. Amen. Amen? So here's what happened in Corinth. People really started liking Apollos. I mean, why wouldn't you? He's eloquent. He's educated. He's handsome. I don't know. 
But all of a sudden, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, right out of the gate, here's what Paul says to the Corinthian church. What I mean is that each of you who says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Here's what Paul, right out of the gate, just says, hey, church of Corinth, you've got some issues. You're being divisive. You're playing favorites. You're saying, oh, I, well, who are you a disciple of? Paul or Paul? Paul says, do away with that. We're all on the same team. This is what Paul then says in a few chapters later, chapter 3 of verse 6. He says these words, um, therefore, as you, yeah, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. Meaning, there is a team mentality here that ultimately God's doing, so he should get the glory for. But just so you know, everyone plays a different part in the whole process of evangelism and edification, saving and sanctifying. Paul says, I planted, praise God for Apollos who comes along in waters. But at the end of the day, who should get the glory? God. And then at the very end of Corinthians, and we don't have it up on the, on the screen, but in chapter 16, verse 12, just to show you how unified Paul and Apollos are, and this is what I love about these two guys, is that they're different, they're their personalities are different. Their education's different. Their upbringing's different. Their gifts are different. They've learned to complete, not compete against one another. They do not allow the Corinthians to make this an dis, a, a, a issue of disunity or disharmony. Here's what Paul says to the Corinthians. I urge the Paulus to go back to you because I know how much you love him. And I said, Paulus, you need to go back and continue to love on those people. And Apollos said, I'm not going back there. I want to stay and work with you and do whatever you want me to do. And there's this sense of unity. And I love that. And I think this is why the church at Corinth, the first letter is really one of correction and calling them out on their stuff. Second Corinthians is an entirely different tone because they've changed their tune. They would not allow the leadership to be divided. They, these guys fought for one another. Man, can we just stop the infighting? Can we just stop the, the in, internal debates of who's better? Listen, uh, like I said, there are uh, tons of other men and women who can preach the gospel better than me, but no one can preach a better gospel. And I'm good with that. Amen? Last point, and we'll, we'll finish with this. So, Paul strengthening churches. Apollos is in Ephesus, but he's incomplete, and Priscilla and Aquila come along and complete him. And now he goes to Corinth, so now he's out of Ephesus, but Paul arrives in Ephesus, which is really interesting, so try to keep up with all this, right? Verse 1, chapter 19, and it came out while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus and found some disciples there. And these disciples, verse 2, he says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, I'm just going to ask you right now, is that an odd question to ask right out of the bat? It is. Has anyone ever asked you this question? All I know is I never asked anybody this question. I'm going, what would prompt Paul to ask this question? Well, this is point number three. He's pr pressing into a deeper examining of ignorant faith. Here's what I'm going to venture to say about this group of disciples. These are probably disciples of Apollos, who at the time of discipling them was incomplete himself. And if all of a sudden you're reproducing your incomplete faith in the life of somebody else, this is not going to end up good. So the disciples are actually worse than the disciple maker because these guys are ignorant. They are disciples, but they're not disciples. What do I mean? There's a disciple that's curious, and then there's a disciple who's committed. We're not about curiosity. We're about commitment here. And Paul comes out and says, hey, you know what? We're hanging out. Cool to meet you guys. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? You know why he asked this question? There was something about their lives that was just a little bit off. He's looking at these disciples, and he's like, you don't look like disciples. He's listening to these guys. You don't sound like disciples. A lot can be said about a person when you spend some time with them. Amen? And these guys are claiming something that they are ultimately ignorant in. And this is why Paul says, 
when did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? And look at the response. We didn't even know if there was a Holy Spirit. Uh-oh. Something's not right here. And he goes, tell me then, who were you baptized into? Here we go again. Baptism of John. Sound familiar? Second verse, same as the first. Here we go. Paul goes, you guys, here's one thing I know. When you come to believe, you get the Spirit. Romans 8, verse 9, write it down. Ephesians 1, verse 13, write it down. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Every believer in Christ gets the Spirit. You will know when you get the Spirit. It will do something in you and through you when you get the Spirit. The fact that these guys are ignorant of the Spirit means they don't have the Spirit. And if you don't have the Spirit, let's backtrack, you don't have Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have genuine faith. And Paul goes, all right, something needs to change here. And what does he do? He calls it out. He's not rebuking. He's not like, he's just asking them some probing questions. And he concludes, these guys don't know the full gospel. Verse 4. Paul says, John baptized. Let me tell you what John did. So he's acquainted. He says he promised, he talked about this baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him. What's the key? Believing in Jesus. Don't believe in John. We don't want converts to John. We want converts to Jesus. And they heard this. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. The only instance in the Bible where someone is rebaptized. Why? Because the first baptism wasn't legit. So Paul says, guys, you don't know. But I want you to know. And what happens next is remarkable. How do we know all of a sudden these guys got it? Because something miraculous happens. Paul lays his hands on them and they begin to speak in tongues and prophesy. And then what does it say next? It says, and they were about 12 men in all. Four times, tongues pops up in the book of Acts. As this supernatural, physical manifestation that the Spirit's doing something. It happens at Pentecost. It happens in Samaria. It happens with Cornelius. And it happens here only four times in the book of Acts. This is the last time tongues happens in, in the book of Acts. You would think in some circles that tongues happens all over the place. It doesn't because there are some people that would tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, you're only a half a Christian. Or you don't know the full gospel. Or you're only partly saved as if a woman could be partly pregnant. Amen? Doesn't happen. So Paul's concerned here. These guys have been rooted in really bad doctrine. And because they're rooted in bad doctrine, it leads to really poor behavior. And there's no experience of the Spirit. I don't even see any joy, any excitement, any, any enthusiasm. There's no power. But all of a sudden that changes when the gospel is accurately shared. They speak in tongues, which is a sign for unbelievers. So obviously there's people around this scene who are unbelieving, and all of a sudden now they hear the gospel in their native tongue, which is the purpose of, of tongues. And then prophecy, which is a gift for edification. Tongues is for evangelism. Prophecy is for edification. Now their minds have been illumined by the Holy Spirit, and now they're able to understand things the natural man has never been able to understand. And they share it. And others are believing. And the Spirit is working. This is awesome. So what, what do we have to learn from this? We have to l learn that we live in a culture that is really devoid and deficient when it understands the gospel. There was a guy who set out, and he visited the top 20 churches in the United States. 
just to get a pulse on what the gospel communication looks like in these top 20 churches, largest churches. He sat under the teaching. He looked at the doctrine. He, he spent some time understanding the culture. And out of 20 churches, guess how many communicated the gospel, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and then baptism of the Holy Spirit appropriately? Zero. Yet they're packed. Why? Because people are more interested in 20 steps to making a stronger marriage than they are in understanding the gospel. Because sharing the gospel does not appeal to the masses. But I tell you what, I need a better marriage. You build a better marriage without Jesus, it is going to be a greater destruction. I just need to raise my kids. Well, come to our our, our seven point part series on Sunday mornings on how to how to raise better children. We're not against better marriages. Please hear me. And we're not against better children. But here's what I am against. Trying to prop you up with good moral behavior without giving you the life-changing core message of the gospel is setting you up for failure. And one of these days you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, why should I let you into my heaven? You don't know me. And they're like, but Lord, did we not build a better marriage? Did we not raise better kids? Did we not embrace a better work ethic and, and give our money to your work? Yeah, but you didn't know me. There is a moral therapeutic deism that exists in our culture that is killing us. God does not want to make your life better without first changing your heart. If you want the gift rather than the giver, good luck with that. It's ultimately going to destroy you. Can I just say, I was harder on the first service than I was you guys. Because I looked out there and I knew some people just needed a little bit harder than, than you guys do. You guys are, you're receiving this well, thank you. This is not easy. But this is not what I want from you. This is what I want for you. And if I stand up here and look like I, I act like I got it together, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm in with you. I am still figuring this stuff out. I'm still a work in progress. I still need to be poured into. I have men in my life that meet with me and pour into me, and I thank God for them. I have Priscilla's and Aquila's into my life who are like, hey, how you doing? Can I, can I tell you something? I, I noticed this. And they're like, okay, I'm listening. And I get to pour into others. But we're doing this, why? Because you have been saved to grow. And if you're not growing in Christ, and that word is not that instrument of growth in your life, we're wasting our time. There's an urgency about what we're, we're, call, we're called to do and be. And that's what I think this passage is really pointing us to this morning. We come tired. We come weary. We come burnt out. Because the presence and power of God is not in us. And perhaps this is just a call to us to examine our hearts and go, where am I? Here's what the Bible says. Examine your life to see if you're in Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, someone stole that and said the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, we need to examine ourselves in Christ. Here's what Jesus promised in John 7. Look at this passage. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow. Literally, gush. Rivers of living water. Some of you, it looks like you barely left the faucet on at night. Dirk, 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 dirk. <laughs> now this he said about the Spirit, right in line with what we're talking about, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Here's the question. Has God been glorified? Has Jesus been glorified? Then the Spirit has come. And if you say you're in Christ, then the Spirit has been deposited. No, you got all of you need and it should be gushing with living water. Where's the presence? Where's the power? If you're feeling like it's not there, stop 
and check yourself. Here's my assignment to you. Homework. Yep, I don't always assign homework, but when I do, I do it with a big smile on my face. You ready? Read 1 John each day this week. 1 John. Some of you are like, oh, great reading. It's five chapters, and it may take you 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Read 1 John one time each day this week. And as you're reading it, there are three things I want you to keep in mind. Because here's why 1 John has been given to us by God. It is a way for God to bring forth assurance and confidence that we're in Christ. Isn't that good to know? Because some of us are like, we're walking through this world, we're like, I don't know if God likes me, I don't know if God loves me. You know, our, our flower with God is the daisy, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me. Get rid of it. You need to have assurance and confidence that you are in Christ. How do we do this? So 1 John gives us three tests. They're in your notes. The doctrinal test is the first one. Meaning that I believe in the real Jesus and what he did. Has your mind and your heart together believed in him whom God has sent? And I'm going to tell you right now, when you read 1 John, you need to maybe write a little D by those verses that pass the doctrinal test. Second is the ethical test. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Right doctrine leads to right behavior. If behavior's off, doctrine's off. Belief leads into behavior. If there's something to miss about behavior, something's to miss about belief. So first, doctrinal. Then there's ethical tests, which says what? You will walk in light and you will walk in love. One of the most famous verses in 1 John is, you say you love God, but you hate your brother. You're, you're a liar. I like how it just pulls no punches. <laughs> right? Like, so the ethical test is this. How does my understanding of, of Jesus change my life? So when you come to those verses, write an E by those verses. Ethical, yeah. Belief has impacted behavior positively. Last test is this, the experiential test. Because we don't want to rule out feelings and experience. We don't want to be led by them, but we also don't want to deem them as unimportant. And here's what the experiential test says, that you will know the abiding presence of the Spirit in you once you're in Christ. First John talks about this. That you will know. It's almost like when Paul says in Romans, right? The Spirit will bear witness with your spirit to remind you who you are in Christ. You're his child. So write another E. I know this could be confusing. So write E-T by ethical. Phone home. And then E-X by experiential. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, the, the experiential ones, there's only a couple verses in 1 John. But the doctrinal and ethical throughout. Because here's my prayer. When you read 1 John and you read it through the lens of these tests that I believe God has given to us to examine our faith, you're going to live in that place that Colossians 2.6 talks about. Paul says this, Colossians 2.6, up on the screen. As you receive Christ as Lord, walk in him meaning you have to continue to walk with Christ. Believing is not a one-time event. It's a lifelong journey, right? I think so many people lose um, that sense of expectancy, that sense of urgency, that sense of, of um, you know, this evidence that God's with me because they left believing at their, at, when they walked down the aisle 20 years ago. Or they made a decision for Jesus 10 years ago. Can I tell you, belief is a, is a one-time event, but it's also a lifetime event. And this is why Jesus says in, in John chapter 6, write it down, look at it later, I don't have it on the screen. 
uh, what must we do to do the works of God? The, the Pharisees asked Jesus. He says to them, this is the work of God that you keep on believing in him whom he has sent. So my daily journey must be one with Christ, walking with him. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's good to have Jesus alongside of you, but it's better to have the spirit inside of you. And the two work with a concerted effort to grow you into the image of Christ Jesus, which brings you incredible contentment, which brings you incredible assurance, which brings you incredible vitality for living. So my prayer for you is this, and we'll close. May the Word of God, along with the Spirit of God, work in you a child of God for the glory of God. How does that sound? The Word of God with the Spirit of God in the heart of the child of God, ultimately for the glory of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand, let's pray. Lord, we are thankful to you that you've given us this, this moment of, I'm going to call it alignment. Um, our cars have been pulling a little bit too much to the right or to the left, and we have not been perhaps in alignment with what you want. We've missed out on really listening to your voice and following your commands and just doing what you would have us do, and, and we just ask you for forgiveness. Um, we've per been pursuing all the things that the world pursues, and we don't look different from the world, and, and that's tiring. Because you have set us apart, O oh Lord. You've called us to be different. And so my prayer is that perhaps the message today has stirred something within us. And, and perhaps there's some in this, in this room who they have not understood what Christ has done for them. And maybe today's the day of salvation. Thank you, God, for doing that, that sovereign work on their hearts. We, we want to welcome them into the family of God. And we want to help them grow in Christ Jesus. I, I'm thankful for the men and women that are in this room that are, that are perhaps there. They, they know, but there's so much that they don't know. And I pray that maybe t this morning has been some of those aha moments where it's like, wow, we get it. I understand like I've never understood. You've given us eyes to see and ears to hear. And, and, and perhaps for all of us, we've heard the, the, the importance of being able to pour into others as we have been poured into ourselves. I pray that, that that tribe would increase here at Missio Day. That we would be a disciple-making church that involves everybody and no one is left out of the process. Thank you so much, Father, for, for giving us this time, for, for your faithfulness to us, for the gift of salvation in Christ Jesus and the blessings that come with that. We are, we are not without anything, but we have everything we need in Christ Jesus. Thank you for that gift. Help us to walk in step with the Spirit, following the voice of Jesus for your glory, O oh Father. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.